background, I think now, share location. It's on PowerPoint. Yes. Can you see the slide now? Oh, yes, so we can. Okay, so let me start from the oh, first uh, slide. Just a yeah. second. Uh, so good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to AZOTOP session uh, in perceptions. Uh, we have Professor Suresh Bhatia with us, who is a professor at the School of Chemical Engineering, uh, University of Queensland. Uh, professor Bhatia received his B.Tech degree in Chemical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, and his master's as well as PhD degree from the University of Pennsylvania. He is a distinguished researcher in adsorption and transport in uh, nanoporous materials and in heterogeneous reaction engineering and has received numerous awards for his research. So we hope you have a great session with him and over to you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, start from the current slide. Yeah. OK, well, thank you for inviting me to uh, present at this uh, wonderful event. Uh, I was supposed to have, in fact, presented last year, but that was canceled and I'm very glad that we could hold it this year and I'm happy to present today. Uh, many of you may not know, I spent uh, a good part of the early part of my career uh, as a faculty at IIT Bombay. So it's really a pleasure for me uh, to be able to present to you all, uh, knowing, of course, that the audience comprises many more students than just the IIT Bombay students. Okay, let me uh, first uh, start with uh, what exactly do I mean by nanoscale? Now, let me just a second. Yeah. So, what is that? So, the, my uh, my talk today is about engineering at the nanoscale. Uh, so, let me start by uh, by sort of introducing what the nanoscale is. As chemical engineers, we are used to mostly working with uh, continuum models and continuum methods at uh, large scales. So, typically, these scales are 100 microns and going up to meters. For example, a chemical reactor may have a diameter of uh, a meter or a, or a few meters and length of 10 meters or so. So we model the packed bed, uh, a catalytic reactor uh, at that scale. And the methods that we use are usually the axial dispersion model or a Navier-Stokes equation to model the fluid flow. And that works pretty well. Now, uh, however, this scale, uh, cannot tell us what the fundamental pro material properties are. What are the diffusion coefficients uh, in our system? What is the viscosity? To access those properties and to be able to predict those properties, we need to get to the nanoscale and account for the molecular texture of the of the fluid, for example, uh, or of the gas. Uh, so, at the nanoscale. You're talking of distances of the order of five angstroms, which is 0.5 nanometers going up to uh, 100 nanometers, which is 1,000 angstroms. So at this scale, you're able to model the mean free path in the fluid, the collisions between the molecules and atoms, and you can predict your system properties or material properties. The methods that we use here are very different from the methods that we use at the continuum scale which is what we use as do as chemical as uh, chemical engineers, which is the Navier-Stokes equations, the diffusion equation, and so on. Uh, at the nanoscale, those models are no longer valid, and we use simulation techniques. So I will be talking today about Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics simulations and some applications of these. Now, while I'll be focusing on the uh, nanoscale uh, here, uh, I want you to recognize that at even smaller scales, uh, you're dealing with uh, electrons. And then you have a different set of methods. These are called ab initio methods, electronic density functional theory, and, uh, the, and the methods for solving the Schrodinger equation for the electrons and get the electron density profile. Uh, we will not be talking about that. We will be talking about uh, the uh, nanoscale and Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics simulations. And also, in between uh, the continuum and nanoscale is the mesoscale, and there's a whole set of techniques to solve problems uh, in this range. Okay, now what 
distinguishes the nanoscale or what's so uh, what's so great about the nanoscale? Well, the nanoscale uh, has provides us with a lot of benefits. At the nanoscale, uh, intermolecular van der Waals forces and electrostatic interactions can be exploited to engineer desired system behavior. Uh, to sort of uh, to explain this a little further, let's look at the Leonard Jones potential. You've all studied that in your physical chemistry courses. Uh, uh, this uh, is the equation for epsilon times sigma over r raised power of 12, which is the repulsive force minus sigma over r raised power of 6. That's the attractive part of the potential. The sum of these multiplied by a energy parameter epsilon, uh, and for this gives you the so-called Leonard Jones potential. And this is the interatomic potential between two atoms when they are spaced a distance r apart, and sigma is a size parameter of the order of the uh, molecular diameter. Here, uh, in this graph on the right, I'm plotting the potential energy between two atoms, uh, and I've scaled it with epsilon, so it's only a function of sigma over r. Uh, and you find that the potential energy has this blue profile, and at about sigma equal to 1.12 or so, it has a, a minimum, and it's strongly attractive at that point. At smaller lengths, at smaller distances, it becomes repulsive. As you know, if two atoms uh, approach each other and you come uh, and they come very close, they are repulsive. But and at this point, at about 1.1 sigma, there's a strong potential minimum. What that means is that they are attracting each other very strongly, the two atoms, and uh, you can take advantage of that if you have in your system, if you have features that have nanoscale size, which is uh, of the order of the molecular size. Now, you can see that this potential energy profile, the blue curve, has a range of about three sigma. R over sigma is about 2.5 here, it's almost already zero. So beyond about three sigma, you don't, the atoms don't see each other. So if you have features smaller than three sigma in your system, you will see a significant attractive potential and you can take advantage to get some to get system properties uh, to your favor. For example, if you have a slit pore uh, in which the spacing between the two, uh, two walls is of the order of two or three sigma of the order of a nanometer, I say of the order of a nanometer because the atomic diameter sigma is typically of the order of three to five angstroms, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 nanometers. So when you're talking of three sigma, you're talking of about a nanometer. So if you have slit, if slit pore of carbon, for example, graphene slit pores of the order of nanometer spacing, you can get a very high density because of uh, whatever you want to absorb, because these atoms are facing a very strong attractive potential, as you can see from this Leonard Jones potential. They, are, they have strong attraction and you can get densities significantly higher than in the bulk gas, even at pressures of a few atmospheres at very modest pressures. So that can be to your advantage to uh, absorb gases in small pores. And then uh, you can preferentially absorb one gas over another and actually do a separation. Examples of materials having such pores are zeolites, for example. I'm showing here zeolite 4 angstrom. This is widely applied for drying gas adsorption in membrane separation catalysis. Uh, and this has got channels of the order of 4 angstroms. Uh, by changing the cation here, sodium, uh, you to calcium, potassium, or other ions, you can actually, or other ions, you can actually adjust the pore size, window size here, and obtain smaller or larger uh, window sizes. And uh, those window sizes can suit the particular application that you're interested in. Now, zeolites have been around uh, for 50, 60 years, 70 years. Uh, they are, uh, and even much or longer than that. I think they came around in the 1940s or earlier. So that's closer to 80 years. Now, uh, more modern and newer materials are uh, metal organic frameworks, for example. Uh, here you have these tetrahedra, zinc tetrahedra, which are coordinated to each other by what is called benzene, uh, like uh, benzene uh, dicarb dicarboxylate. Uh, these are uh, link linker molecules uh, you see here, these benzenes 
you're, they are leaking these zinc tetrahedra, which have oxygens on them. So have these on a lattice, and you can see you have alternative, uh, alternating uh, pores of size 1.1 nanometers and 1.5 nanometers. These are the cages. So you have these kinds of materials with these nanoscale pores, and they can be potentially applied. These are new materials, so do not as yet, uh, they're not as yet used in industry, but they have potential applications in membrane separation, gas storage, drug delivery, catalysis. So there's uh, a lot of work going on in applying these materials uh, in these applications. Then you have uh, newer materials called zeolitic imidazolate uh, frameworks, ZIFs. They have these kinds of structures that I'm showing here at the bottom, the bottom two. Uh, and again, these are cage window structures. They have zeolitic uh, topologies, uh, topologies of a zeolite, and which is why they are called zeolitic imidazolate framework. So you have here zinc, uh, nitrogen uh, tetrahedra that are coordinated by an imidazolate uh, ligand here. Is, uh, and so that's why they are called ze zeolitic imidazolate frameworks. Uh, you also have carbon nanotubes. You all would have heard of it, heard of these. So nanotubes, for example, are being touted for desalination or they're being examined for desalination, gas storage, gas separation, water filtration, battery, supercapacitors, a lot of biomedical applications as well, and in electronics, in displays. So these kinds of materials are now finding increasing uh, research uh, or increasing uh, attraction for uh, are attractive candidates for research for a number of applications. And again, the key feature here is that you're able to exploit the strong adsorption uh, and the uh, potential energy, attractive potential energy at the nanoscale. Another common material is activated carbon. We all uh, know this very well. Uh, it's a very cheap, simple material. Here's activated carbon powder. It's used in uh, air and gas purification, water treatment, food and beverage processing, pharmaceutical, medical uses. Uh, this is a transmission electron microscope uh, of uh, a microscope picture of uh, activated carbon. Uh, if you skeletonize the image, this is through image processing, you can actually see that you have these narrow pores. This bar here is five, five nanometers, 50 angstroms. And you can see these pores on the order of a nanometer, five, 10 angstrom, very narrow pores. And that is why carbon uh, is, uh, is so important as an adsorbent. It's probably the most important adsorbent around in the world has a market of dollar five billion. So you can see why it pays to understand and exploit the nanoscale. So the applications of nanopores materials uh, I've just mentioned was, uh, as I've discussed as I've discussed these materials, there are numerous applications and I've mentioned many of these already. Uh, in addition to what I've mentioned, uh, carbon's gasification of carbon is, a, is something that we all uh, know uh, and have been exposed to. This carbon has nanoscale pores and uh, it, uh, important thing about understanding the nanoscale is that we can model gasification the kinetics of gasification, not only the reactions, but also the transport into these nanoscale pores. Electrochemical processes, battery supercapacitors, they also rely on nanoscale phenomena, gas storage, geosequestration. Now there's also interest in drug delivery by encapsulating drugs in nanomaterials. And when you ingest the drug, it is slowly released uh, in your body. There is also this new technique of transdermal uh, drug delivery by skin patch. Your skin, uh, the top layer um, comprises of uh, lipid, uh, lipid bilayers. These are nanoscale layers of fat through which the drug must diffuse. So understanding this diffusion process requires an understanding of phenomena at the nanoscale. So you can see how understanding nanoscale phenomena in complex pore structures of nanopores materials is very important to their applications and to optimizing these applications. So in my own research, we focus on the simulation of the structure, equilibrium and transport in nanopores materials. So the heart of every problem or the central to every problem is the structure of the nanopores materials. For zeolites, MOFs, 
cavern nanotubes. The structure is very well known through X-ray diffraction. And here, for example, are various nanoporous materials. We know the structure from diffraction exactly. However, for uh, carbons, which are complex materials, I showed you the complex pore structure of carbon. You need special techniques. Uh, and we can model through simulation techniques the structure of a carbon. Here on the right side, I'm showing the structure of a carbon, uh, a saccharose-derived carbon. Uh, we obtain it by simulating the the small angle scattering, this is the small angle neutron scattering pattern or a synchrotron scattering pattern of a carbon. And you simulate that and by simulation technique, you can get the structure that will reproduce this uh, pattern while minimizing the energy of the structure. So this requires a special kind of Monte Carlo simulation and I'll talk about it shortly. Uh, so once you have the structure, whether it be through a reverse Monte Carlo simulation of this kind or from X-ray diffraction, you can predict the behavior of fluids within that structure uh, for any application. For example, in gas storage, we have worked with hydrogen and methane storage in, in carbons and other materials. Geosequestration, where you put in carbon dioxide into the pores of a coal or other porous material underground, so you sequester the CO2. What is the amount of CO2 you can sequester, the swelling behavior of the coal at the high pressures at which you will put uh, introduce the CO2. All of that can be predicted through simulation techniques. We work with membranes, and I'll talk about membranes uh, later today. In addition to, uh, so in membranes, we are interested in gas separation and knowing the pore structure of the membrane to be able to predict the fluxes and transport rates through the membrane and the selectivity for any particular species. We also do generic nanoscale transport theory. Um, I will be talking about Monte Carlo and molecular dynamic simulations, which is what are essential to be able to predict the behavior of fluids in a nanoporous material, the equilibrium as well as the transport properties. And once you have uh, studied at the nanopore scale, we want to be able to do multi-scale modeling to predict at the large scale when you have a collection of nanopores that are networked with each other. So one has special techniques for it, uh, effective medium theory, or you can use uh, uh, you can use finite element methods on a model of the macrostructure to be able to predict the behavior at the macro scale. So why do conventional uh, materials, uh, why do conventional models fail at the nanoscale? Uh, there are several reasons. The first is in nanoscale pores, the molecular texture of this fluid becomes important, but is overlooked in continuum models. For example, if you use the Navier-Stokes equation for a cylindrical pore, uh, for a cylindrical tube, using uh, yeah. using the uh, no slip at the walls, uh, the no slip model of the walls, then our assumption you obtained this quadratic velocity profile. You would have all seen this in your fluids courses or your unit operations. And that's the volumetric flow rate at a given pressure drop. Well, this does not account for the molecular texture of the fluid. And it doesn't account for the interactions between the fluid molecules and the solid surface. In fact, the no slip boundary condition that we use at the surface of the pore is not valid uh, in reality. Molecules are colliding with the wall, and as they bounce off the wall, there is they are losing some momentum, and that's the friction of the wall. And that friction is countering the pressure drop in the pore. When you apply a pressure drop, you're applying a force, essentially a force, which is the delta P times the area. And that force is balanced by the frictional force, and then you will get a steady state flow. If you did not have the friction in the wall, the fluid would just accelerate to infinity under the action of a pressure gradient. So you need to be able to model the, uh, the bounces of the molecules from the pore wall in order to be able to correctly predict the transport at the nanoscale. This no slip boundary condition is an approximation. It works reasonably at very large scales. That means in pipes and tubes, but when you get to nanopores, uh, it is a failure. We have to account for the molecular texture and uh, use completely different methods. The other reason is that if a pore is very short, then the ends will play a role. 
these kinds of equations, like the Poiseuil model that I have, I have here in this yellow box, this is valid far from the entrance. As you can see, you have not in deriving this, you have not even used the boundary, anything to do with the boundaries. You have uh, integrated the Navier-Stokes equations or use a shell balance and obtained this for an infinitely long pore. The fluid near the entrance or the exit is seeing other molecules on one side and the solid on one side, but not on the other. And so you have an asymmetry there that must be accounted for. All right, how do we do it? Let's first talk about fluid equilibrium in at the nanoscale. Suppose you want to determine what is the adsorbed phase density inside a pore given the bulk pressure outside, which is P. Let's say hydrogen is being adsorbed in a, in a nanopore here, and you know the pressure here. How do we know what is the density of the hydrogen in this uh, in the pore? So this is where we uh, develop, we have developed a technique. Uh, not when I say we, it means science, uh, uh, researchers have developed a technique. Uh, we have used this technique, but this originally came around in the during the uh, Manhattan Project when they uh, were building the nuclear bomb in the U.S. That's when they just developed this uh, this technique of uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So in here, you have bulk gas at pressure P. You want to be able to predict the density of the fluid uh, inside the pore at that pressure. So what we do is uh, we do a simulation uh, in which we add molecules inside the pore, starting with an empty pore, and, and uh, create a number of configurations of molecules inside. That means the molecules can be uh, moved around, the, you add and subtract molecules, and in each configuration you calculate the total number of molecules and then you, between all the configurations, you average the number of molecules over all the configurations, divide by the volume, and you have the mean density, expected density. And uh, the technique basically works by equating the chemical potential of the molecules in the pore or the fluid in the pore to that in the bulk. And when the chemical potentials are equal, then you take all those configurations average the uh, number of molecules uh, in all these configurations and you can calculate the density. And to do this simulation, well, it's most important that you calculate at every step, every move that you make in deleting a molecule, adding a molecule or moving a molecule, at every step you calculate the energy of your configuration. The configurational energy is defined by the coordinates of all the N atoms or molecules in the system at that in that configuration. And this comprises the sum of the potential energy, fluid solid potential energy of all the molecules in your system. That means for every molecule, you calculate the interaction potential with a solid and add up all those interactions. That's the fluid solid interaction potential. And then for every molecule, you look at the interaction with the other molecules in your system. So this total potential energy is critical. This uh, is then minimized you know, uh, while maintaining uh, the same chemical potential as in the bulk, because you know at equilibrium, the chemical potential is the same everywhere. So once you've got the same chemical potential, you are able to get the density. And in accepting or rejecting a move, which is deleting an atom or adding an atom or molecule, it's the change in potential energy that is important. So we have a simulation box in which we insert atoms or molecules at random positions and uh, or we can move a molecule from one position to another like I'm showing here from this position here. We have moved the molecule to this position here. And when you make the move, you calculate delta EC, the change in the configuration energy, which is the configuration energy is the total energy of your system. The change, the energy after your move, the energy before the move, the difference is delta EC. If the energy change is positive, it is the move is less likely to be accepted. And if the move is not accepted, you move the molecule back to where it was. So you you do moves uh, of translation, you uh, rotation. If it is a uh, it is a polyatomic molecule or a diatomic molecule, you will rotate it, and you will also see a change in the energy. And so 
Uh, you, you can add a molecule, which is creation. You can delete a molecule, take it away. At every move, you will see a change in energy and you accept the move based on certain probabilities. And these are thermodynamically derived. So I will not go through the details of how they are derived, but it's basically you need to calculate this, the change in energy when you make the move. F is the fugacity that you're after. So if you're fixing the chemical potential, you're as, as uh, it's as good as saying you're fixing the fugacity. So you choose the fugacity and then all these moves of translation, rotation, creation, deletion are accepted based on certain pre-specified probabilities. And at the end, after a long time, uh, and this is after millions and millions of moves, what you find is that the number N of molecules in your system now is stable and uh, it fluctuates around a sort of mean value and uh, the energy is also stable. So that's when your system is equilibrated and you can now average among all the configurations, the value of N and obtain the density. So let me now uh, introduce an application that we have looked at, which is that of hydrogen storage. Now, this is something that has been around for 30 years uh, and uh, hydrogen storage has not really uh, made its mark. Uh, that's because it's very difficult to store hydrogen, uh, no matter what technique that has been uh, applied, things have not worked out. And uh, what I will show today is how simulation explains it. In fact, Long before people uh, stopped working on hydrogen storage, uh, we were able to show that it's not going to work. Uh, now, the reason why we want to store hydrogen uh, is, of course, uh, if uh, it's for automobiles and transportation applications, for example. The conventional app, uh, way would have been as a gas. You put it at high pressures in a cylinder and you then run your car uh, using that uh, uh, using that stored hydrogen. But the problem is that hydrogen is highly combustible. These cylinders to get say 400 kilometers of driving distance in one tankful, you need uh, 600 bar pressure for a reasonably sized tank, uh, which is about maybe a quarter of the size of your car, literally. Uh, you'll need very high pressure and that's very dangerous, a, a slight, uh, pinhole can uh, cause an explosion if the hydrogen leaks from it. Uh, it can and uh, if there uh, if there's any heat nearby. So this uh, is considered dangerous. And for that reason, uh, there have been uh, so there have been many studies to try to find alternative ways of storing the hydrogen. One of them is, of course, liquid phase storage. But that liquid phase storage means you have to keep uh, your containers, hydrogen container liquid at 20K, which is uh, an engineering uh, problem. How do you store uh, safely hydrogen at 20K and keep it uh, liquefied without uh, allowing it to evaporate inside your container? So that again uh, is practically impossible. So people have looked at uh, physics option, which is absorbing hydrogen in materials like activated carbons, carbon nanotubes in metal organic frameworks. Uh, as that has been one option. The other option has been chemisorption or and chemical reaction, for example, as metal hydrides. The Department of Energy of the US long ago said you need 6.5% by weight of hydrogen in whatever material that you store. And that's uh, accounting for peripherals, uh, the weight of the tank, the pipes. So if, in terms of per unit weight of the material, it's probably even more than 6.5%. Hydrides have not worked out because uh, to get because it's chemisorbed or chemically reacted to get the hydrogen out of a hydride, you need three four hundred degrees temperature, um, and well above uh, what is considered a reasonable temperature for a car to desorb, which is about 100, 150 degrees. So this has hydrides have not worked out, and uh, physisorption has been considered a better option. But as I, as I will show, even that uh, is not likely to work out. Do we want to take any questions at this point or shall I continue and finish off this a few slides on hydrogen storage? Yes, we do have some questions. Uh, yes, okay, I will stop yeah. at this point and take some questions. Yeah, so Aditya Shetty is asking that, could you please explain the application of nanoporous materials in gas storage? I think you explained a bit, but uh, if you could uh, do that again, it would. That's be exactly what I'm doing now in hydrogen, isn't it? 
Yeah, so, storage. Yeah, so uh, is it uh, is it applicable only to hydrogen or for all gases? It can be applicable to any gas. You can uh, you can store carbon dioxide if you can find a uh, if you can find a safe way to keep your nanopores material and it, and if it is cheap enough, then uh, your uh, carbon dioxide can be captured in a nanopores material. And if you want to store it for the millennia, you can do that in the nanopores material. If you can do it in a practical way, that is uh, keep the material uh, pressurized and sa safely disposed away. Uh, you can store that methane, for example, natural gas can be stored in carbons and I will talk about it. Uh, and that uh, is a viable option uh, as an alternative to. Uh, to petrol as a fuel. So there are, in fact, natural gas cars runs cars that run on uh, methane uh, natural gas, but of course. Uh, currently, most of them are using compressed natural gas, but you can store it in a in a carbon as I will show that that uh, is a reasonable option. So it's not just hydrogen. The pores, because you have a strong potential energy in a pore, you can store any gas inside it. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Uma Mahesh. He's asking, what are the ways in which manufacturing of nano-engineered materials can be scaled up to make them more cost-effective? Right, so that is an interesting question. I'm a theoretician, so I don't uh, really make nanomaterials, although I have dabbled in and made materials like MCM41. These are expensive because they use surfactants. And uh, and so to make them, uh, you, uh, you are using surfactants and then you burn them off. If there's a way you can solvent extract them, uh, take them out and techniques are being worked at uh, to do that and then be able to recover the fact and reuse it uh, with minimal losses, you can reduce the cost. Uh, but at this time, uh, it turns out from whatever simulations we have done and whatever I have seen of experimental data in the literature, and we have also done experiments, uh, I do not think these uh, many of these materials outperform simple, cheap, activated carbons yet. So these are materials that are really looking for a solution. And what our job is now is to be able to use uh, our simulation tools uh, to be able to analyze the transport, optimize the properties, and then as they become cheaper, we should be able to uh, design processes and be able to uh, develop uh, nanotechnologies that are also uh, cost effective. I do admit that at the moment, uh, we are not seeing uptake of these uh, technologies simply because they are not cost effective. So that is a good question. But while uh, they are not being taken up as yet, uh, there is a lot of interest because uh, you do see improved properties. The question is, when will they be cheap enough uh, to replace conventional materials? Uh, we do not know, but uh, work. the experimentalists are, of course, working at it. Predominantly, you have to be able to recover uh, the solvents and as well as the surfactants that you use to make them. Okay, great. Thank or you. Or make them out of cheap materials. Okay, cheap thank reagents. you. Right. Uh, that, that's it with the questions right now. Uh, you may continue. Okay, so but let me now continue with hydrogen storage. So I'll talk about physisorption of hydrogen, uh, and uh, as I said, there's been a lot of work that has been done, but we were able to show that uh, from very simple thermodynamics and simulations that this really is not a viable option. Okay, so somewhere in around 2005, 2006, I did simulations along with a colleague at the University of Pennsylvania, Professor Alan Myers, in which we simulated for slit pore carbons, the density of hydrogen in the pores as a function of pressure for pores of various sizes. Here is a curve I'm showing. Uh, here are curves I'm showing of hydrogen and methane uh, uh, inside slit pore carbons of different width. Now, uh, so this these simulations use the grand canonical Monte Carlo technique, which I have just told you about, which is you put an, uh, the molecules inside the pores, you move them, add molecules, remove molecules while maintaining the chemical potential corresponding to the external bulk pressure. 
and you're able to get the equilibrium about uh, density of the hydrogen inside the pore or methane inside the pore. So when you, if you were to store hydrogen and then recover it um, in a car, in a car, for example, if you store hydrogen inside a slit pore carbon or inside a carbon, and then uh, when you're going to use or burn the hydrogen in your engine and desorb the hydrogen, you will exhaust it. Ultimately, you will exhaust your hydrogen cylinder to maybe 1.5 bar, and uh, you're going to pressure, keep that, uh, you're going to, when you absorb the hydrogen, you will pressurize it to about 30 bar. That's typically what is considered reasonable. Uh, if you do not have absorption, then as I said, you have to go to six or 700 bar in your cylinder. Uh, that's just way too uh, dangerous. So at 30 bar, what I found was that, uh, what we found that uh, uh, in here, this lowest curve here, you get even at the uh, maximum, uh, the optimal pore size of about 0.7 nanometer, which is seven angstroms, you get a density of about 2.5 millimoles per cc. And you typically have about one cc of pore space per gram of carbon. So you're talking of 2.5 millimoles per gram, and given that the atomic weight or molecular weight of hydrogen is two, you're talking about 0.5 weight percent. So at best, at, this is at 300K, at best you are going to get about half weight percent storage. In fact, the DOE target is 6.5 weight percent delivery, not just storage, but delivery. And uh, uh, so this is just doesn't seem viable. At 250 bar, external pressure, this is the red uh, circles, that's what we got from simulation, Monte Carlo simulation in pores of various sizes. You're finding a peak density of about uh, 11 or so. But what you find is even the bulk, you have a density of 10 millimoles per cc, which is the density inside the pore. <laughs> so if you have very high pressure, you can you you are not going to see much improvement in the density inside the pore at the same chemical potential. The pore density is also much like the same as the bulk. So there's no benefit to absorbing it. At 30 bar, you're getting twice the density. You had 1.2 millimoles per cc in the bulk, but you get 2.5 in the pore. You see some benefit, but it's just not enough uh, to meet the requirements. If you store at this density, your cylinder is going to be uh, bigger than the size of your car. It's uh, unless you go to at, at 30 bar. If you go to 600 bar, then you will get uh, a reasonably sized cylinder, but that's too dangerous. So methane uh, at 30 bar shows uh, the curve here uh, with a peak density of 11.5. Uh, at 0.7 nanometer pore size and about 0.9 nanometer pore size, it's got a density of about 8.5. The eight, the 0.9 nanometer pore size is preferable because if you have a very narrow pore of 0.7 nanometers, only one molecule uh, in the pore cross section can fit, and you have very uh, high friction with the pore walls, and the transport coefficient is low. At this pore size, 0 0.9 nanometer, you'll get good transport coefficient so you can absorb and desorb rapidly. And so that is a preferable pore size. Now, uh, so unless gas separation is required, then of course you may want to go for a 0.7 nanometer pore, but if you want to store it and desorb it, then 0 0.9 is the better pore size. If you assume uh, hexagonal uh, close packing uh, in a 0 0.9 nanometer, 0 0.9 nanometer pore size, uh, for methane storage at about 8.5 millimoles per cc, you can calculate that you will get about 13.6 uh, uh, weight percent uh, of methane, uh, which is fairly good, much higher than this, what you can get with hydrogen. Now, a lot of these results you can obtain, you can explain in a very simple way using simple thermodynamics. Uh, so let's, uh, uh, particularly for hydrogen, let's, uh, let's assume uh, hydrogen is absorbed in a slit pore. Because hydrogen is weakly absorbing, uh, it's, uh, which is why its critical temperature is very low, 30 K, because it's weakly absorbing, you just cannot condense it. it intermolecular interactions are weak, so it doesn't condense easily. 
So let's assume, uh, because it's weakly absorbing, you can assume that it absorbs by Langmuir isotherm. So at pressure P1, when you pressurize a cylinder, you will store uh, amount equivalent to the first term, Kp1 Nm or 1 plus Kp1, where Nm is the capacity of the adsorbent. Now, when you exhaust it at pressure P2, then this is what is left behind, Kp2 Nm or 1 plus K, Kp2. The difference is what you have delivered or what you have obtained or used uh, in running your automobile or whatever purpose you are desorbing it for. So D, D is the delivery. You can actually div, uh, maximize D and uh, differentiate D with respect to the equilibrium constant, set it equal to zero, and you will get K equal to one over square root of P1, P2. Uh, and if P1 is 30 bar, P2 is 1.5 bar, you find the optimum K is 0 0.149. You can do a second derivative and prove to yourself that D is a maximum at this K. What that means is the best possible adsorbent that works between 1.5 and 30 bar must have 0.149 K. And if you put that value of K in this equation, uh, and P1, P2 of 1.5, 30, and uh, 1.5, you will get the maximum delivery. The maximum amount that you can deliver is 0.635 of the capacity. If your capacity is NM, you're delivering 0.635 NM. Now, if you assume the hydrogen in a 0.92 nanometer pore is uh, packed uh, in hexagonal close packing, then uh, you can calculate that the maximum density of maximum delivery is 5.8%. That's still less than 6.5, but not too bad. But that's for the optimum adsorbent. Real adsorbents like carbons have much lower K, and that is why in the last slide, we we were nowhere near at room temperature at 300 K. Uh, we are nowhere near 5.8%. You're only 0.5% uh, because the K is much smaller. So we uh, did simulations uh, of the amount absorbed in pores of different sizes, as I said, and at different pressures. The Langmuir isotherm is here. Uh, and if you plot P over N versus pressure, uh, and just by rearranging the Langmuir equation, you can obtain this. If you plot P or N versus pressure, you should expect a straight line if this equation is obeyed. <coughs> In fact, our simulations um, uh, fitted this perfectly. From the slope and intercept, you can obtain K and as, as well as uh, NM. From the slope and intercept, you can obtain that. So that tells you the K and NM of a real carbon point. Uh, because we did this in carbon slit pores, the 0.149 optimal value is for the imaginary optimal material. That's not your real carbon. Now, the K is, of course, we know given as one over P naught um, e raised for minus delta G naught over RT, where that's the free energy change. P naught is the reference pressure, usually taken as one atmosphere. So delta G naught is delta H naught minus T delta S, which you, and so you can write K in this way with P naught as one. And K is, of course, the optimal K is one over square root of P1, P2. So you can turn this around uh, by equating this these two exponentials product uh, to one over square root of P1, P2, you can obtain delta H naught optimal because one over square root of P1, P2 is the optimal K. So the you can, Therefore, for those pressures, P1 and P2, the optimal heat is given by this equation, which just comes from this here by solving for delta H naught. That's the optimal heat. From our simulations, and again, I won't talk about the details, how we do it, but we can calculate delta S naught, the entropy change of adsorption. It turns out to be minus 8R. And uh, you might have read in your physical chemistry courses, uh, or even in your high school chemistry, that when a gas condenses to a liquid, the, on an average, the entropy change is minus 10.5 R. It's called Troughton's rule. You might have read it in your physical chemistry, first year physical chemistry. The adsorption, you don't convert it to a liquid, but something close, so your delta S is not as large as uh, minus 10, it's minus 8 R, approximately for all these pore sizes. That is what we found from simulation. If you plug that in here with P1 and P2 of 1.5 and 30, you get the optimal heat is 15.1. That means the 
so-called ideal material or the holy grail for hydrogen storage, the holy grail material should have a heat of absorption of 15.1. So this has combined simple thermodynamics and uh, simulations at the nanoscale. Well, these simulations uh, were, of course, of the real carbon slit, and uh, they gave us delta S naught of eight minus eight. That's valid all the time in these slits. But what you find is that the heat of absorption was only around five to ten kilojoules per mole, much lower than the optimal material. The optimal material uh, has this with uh, P one P two being. Uh, for 30 and 1.5, it should have a heat of 15.1. Now, what we found in our simulations that carbons can only give you a heat of 5 to 10, much lower. And in fact, experimentally, it's typically of the order of 5 to 8. And for carbons, an average value is 5.8 kilojoules per mole for minus delta H. You're far from this. And that is why a carbon will not, uh, will not work. And in fact, I've examined all kinds of materials, none of them will work. So this is work we did many years ago uh, in 2006. So what I'm talking about today is work that I've done over the last 20 years uh, in this field of uh, nanoscale uh, science and engineering. So here are some experimental data from Bernard and Chahin in 22, 2002. Uh, and uh, our simulations using Monte Carlo simulations work pretty well on this data. We did have to fit a pore size distribution because not all the pores are of the same size. <clears throat> now, if you were to uh, take the amount adsorbed at say 30 bar at any temperature and the amount adsorbed at 1.5 bar, take the difference, that's the delivery. So I'm plotting here the experimental delivery, which is the circles, which is based on the experimental data and the dash dotted curve based on Monte Carlo simulations and you find they match pretty well. So our Monte Carlo simulation matches experimental data very well. And in fact, both produce an optimal temperature of the for, for the carbon of about 100 K. <clears throat> that means that with because the heat of absorption for a carbon is very low of the order of 5.8, at room temperature, you get very little delivery, but at very low temperatures, you get much larger delivery. And here you're talking of about 17 millimoles per kilogram, that's about 3.4%. Uh, that's much larger than what you can get at room temperature. At room temperature, you're talking of uh, about two or so 2.5 millimoles per gram or moles per kilogram, 2.5 moles per kilogram, which is about 0.4% or 0.5%. So you can see the optimal temperature because of the low heat of absorption of a carbon, the optimal temperature is very low. And in fact, if you use this equation, which I just showed, you turn it around, you can write T optimal is given by this. And now instead of using 15.1, you use the actual heat of a carbon of 5.8, you get an optimal temperature of 115, which is very close to the experimental value. Based simple on simple thermodynamics, combining simulation and thermodynamics, you can show that hydrogen storage will only work at very low temperatures. <clears throat> this is now recognized uh, by uh, a lot by the uh, community working on hydrogen storage, and in fact, Toyota has gone back to its original to the standard solution of having a hydrogen cylinder. They make this. They've got an experimental car running around in different places of the world using a fuel cell with hydrogen being stored in a carbon fiber cylinder, and it's glass lined, and this is stored at 70 MPa, which is 700 bar. That's where we are with hydrogen storage. After all this activity, where I think maybe billions of dollars has been spent in, if not billions, hundreds of billions has been spent worldwide on research in finding materials for hydrogen storage. Simple thermodynamics and simulations tell us that uh, it's not going to work. Okay, so that was uh, hydrogen storage, and in particular, I wanted to show an application of Monte Carlo simulation, how you can predict densities in pores and show and look at the prospects for hydrogen storage. What if you're interested in transport? This is where you have to do develop another technique or use another technique, which is called molecular dynamics simulations. Molecular dynamics simulations allows us to determine the transport coefficient in any system. So in molecular dynamics, we solve the equations of motion. 
I showed you how in Monte Carlo you create a system of molecules or atoms inside a pore. Uh, you have n molecules or atoms. Uh, if you want the transport coefficient, you now take these n molecules inside the pore, consider their interactions and the forces between the molecules, and write down the equations of motion for every molecule. So Ri double dot is the acceleration of a molecule. This is the force. This is uh, 1 over M times the force on that molecule due to all the other molecules in your system. So what is the force when you have a potential energy fee? Force is the gradient of chemical of the potential energy. So del with respect to the coordinates of molecule I, uh, del of the potential energy of the interaction with the other molecules. So that gives you the force to the other molecules. And then, uh, and this also includes the force due to the solid. So one of these J is also the solid. So this gives you the acceleration of any given molecule in the system. Now in molecular dynamics, just like in an experiment, you uh, you dissipate heat due to viscous uh, dissipation. And so uh, if you do not have a thermostat in molecular dynamics, just like in any system also, you need a thermostat to control the temperature. We introduce a thermostat in molecular dynamics and scale the velocities by a, uh, by a scaling factor lambda, which, uh, which uh, we determine based on certain rules. So I won't talk about it, but just that this acceleration is affected not just by the by the potential energy gradient of the molecule, but also by the thermostat that you apply. And then uh, you can give an applied acceleration, which could be the pressure drop in your system. Uh, so the force per molecule divided by the mass of the molecule give, give you the applied acceleration. So you solve these equations of motion for all the N molecules in your system. And from the trajectories of the molecules, you can, there are ways that you can calculate what is the diffusivity. So it's too complex a subject for me to go into details of how we calculate the diffusivity from the molecular dynamics. There are equations available, so I will bypass that, but just to sort of give you the idea that you can solve the Newtonian equations of motion for all the molecules in your system. And from the trajectories of the molecules, you can determine the well, uh, the transport coefficient for that molecule, for that species. Now, how does transport occur? If it's a single species, the transport is driven by a pressure gradient. If there are many species, the transport is driven by partial pressure gradients. In reality, of course, it's the chemical potential gradient that matters. And in fact, for an ideal gas, for example, the chemical potential gradient will be RT del log uh, partial pressure, right? Because uh, d mu is RT d log P for an ideal gas. So the chemical potential gradient is related to the gradient of log of partial pressure. And this is what is the driving force for transport. So if you have a mixture of molecules, uh, say a red colored molecule is one species, yellow is another species, you have chemical potentials mu one on one side, mu two on the other for the red molecules, mu three on one side, mu four on the other, and you will see transport. You will see the diffusion and motion of the molecules and even a separation in a narrow pore. The yellow may move faster than the red, for example, so you will see a a higher flux of yellow over the red, and you can separate the red and yellow. So the mole fraction in the permeate that you get on the right side uh, for the yellow will be more than the mole fraction on the left side. And so you have essentially then separated them. As I mentioned, there's always a friction. So when a molecule collides to the wall, uh, it undergoes a momentum change and there is a momentum loss. And that leads to the frictional force that actually allows this fluid to have an equilibrium uh, or a steady state flow. Without that, uh, that friction, you would not have steady state. Now, in molecular dynamics, once you solve the equations of motion for the molecules in your system uh, and you obtain transport coefficients, uh, you would, uh, and you have obtained the transport coefficients in molecular dynamics, then you can calculate the fluxes from those transport coefficients. Uh, one way is the Onsager formulation. That means if you have a chemical potential gradient del mu j of species j, then uh, an omega ij are what are called the Onsager coefficients, which you obtain from molecular dynamics. 
the flux of species i is then sigma j omega ij minus del mu j. So the flux of species i depends also on the chemical potential of the other species, and that's due to the intermolecular friction. In chemical engineering, we generally do, uh, do not use the Onsager formulation. We will use, uh, it's more common to use something like the maxwell stefan formulation, which is given here. So Xi is the mole fraction of species I, Ct is the total concentration, del mu I is the, uh, is the mole fraction, is the chemical potential gradient of species I. And this is given in terms of the fluxes of I and J and their mole fractions and diffusion, binary diffusivity is Dij and uh, a pure, a diffusivity D cross I of species I, which is the diffusivity of species I in the salt due to this Sol interactions with the solid and Dij are the binary diffusivities due to interaction between I and J. So you can, of course, invert this re, uh, using matrix methods obtained uh, Ni in terms of the chemical potential gradients of the uh, of the various species and write it in the Onsager form and relate the Dij, D cross Ij, and D cross I to the omega Ij from molecular dynamics. So that way, using molecular dynamics, you can get these D cross IJ, D cross I, and you can then predict fluxes in a membrane or in a pore or any system. So I'm going to now illustrate an application of this uh, for isotope separation. A separation of isotopes, uh, particularly of light isotopes, uh, is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, hydrogen is one uh, material whose isotopes are very important. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. It exists as one part in 6,500 in hydrogen, and uh, it's got many uses. It's used as a moderator in fission reactors. It's used in instrument lighting. These little uh, lights in instruments are usually uh, usually have deuterium in them. It's used as a non-reactive tracer in research and industry. That means you replace hydrogen by deuterium uh, in a molecule, and you can now trace the phase of fate of hydrogen when you uh, so when you react that molecule or conduct any process using that molecule. Uh, it's got large potential uses in future fusion reactors. Tritium is another isotope. It's got it's one in ten to the power of eighteen parts of hydrogen in water has a half-life of 12 and 12.3 years, and it has many uh, uses. It's used in nuclear weapons as a booster, uh, together with uh, deuterium, and is a future fuel for fusion reactors. It's used as a tracer, uh, and it's used in self-illuminating signs. You might have seen these luminous watches. These dials, uh, the luminous part of the dial here, actually has tritium. Uh, tritium, uh, so you have a phosphorus and paint uh, at these places with the hydrogen in the paint being replaced by tritium. As the tritium, uh, it's radioactive, it gives off beta rays, they interact with the phosphorus and paint, part of the paint, and uh, that the beta rays are absorbed, absorbed and it emits light uh, in the visible range, and that's how the light, the dial is luminous. Uh, the exit signs, uh, even in aeroplanes, at fire escapes, they yeah, they often uh, also have this uh, luminous paint uh, that is used that has tritium. Another separation is hydrogen and helium. Uh, high, helium-3 is uh, of increasing interest uh, due to it, its high demand and short supply. It occurs 1.38 ppm in uh, helium-4, and it's got uses in NMR-based medical imaging. And as the world is running short of helium, uh, for NMR machines to work, we need uh, we need this, and it's used in detectors and is used as a potential nuclear fuel, also in dilution refrigeration for temperatures in the millikelvin range. So there's a lot of separation of light isotopes uh, that are important. Now we've worked on this separation of hydrogen and deuterium. Uh, I recognized uh, at the time uh, this, uh, which was around 2005, that. While isotopes, they have the same molecular size because the size of the molecule is determined by the electron shell, not by the nucleus. The difference between isotopes is in the nucleus. And so it was thought until then that they cannot be separated by molecular sieving because isotopes are the same size. However, uh, 
at low temperatures, you can recognize that uh, a light molecule uh, will have a certain uncertainty because the de Broglie wavelength lambda uh, is given as h over square root of 2 pi mkt. So if, if it's a light molecule and the mass m is very low, the uncertainty in the center for the position of that molecule lambda can be uh, significant. So at 40 K, so you're talking of small mass and low temperature, lambda can be significant. Uh, so at 40 K, the lambda for hydrogen is 0.19 and the lambda for deuterium is 0.14. What that means is the hydrogen will appear as a larger molecule than deuterium. So let's say this here yellow molecule is hydrogen and you have a small uncertainty in the center of mass. So it's the molecule is bobbing around with it, with this uncertainty. So it will appear almost like it is this larger sphere. Deuterium will appear smaller because its uncertainty is smaller. It's got a larger mass. It's double the molecular weight of hydrogen. It, so its uncertainty is smaller. It will appear smaller. So maybe I thought materials, nanopores materials can be used to separate them at low temperature. So simulations can be used. We did molecular dynamic simulations and we used what is called the thin Feynman Hibbs path integral formulation uh, formalism. Uh, in that formalism, uh, the potential energy, intermolecular potential, which is normally phi of R, is now modified due to the uncertainty of the uh, of the molecular positions uh, with, with this with standard deviation lambda. So every molecule is now taken to be a Gaussian wave with standard with uh, standard deviation lambda in the uh, in the position, and so the intermolecular po uh, potential is now integrated with this Gaussian distribution of the uncertainty r, and uh, you obtain the new po uh, pair potential, and you have to use this to model the behavior, uh, the uh, behavior due to the quantum uncertainty. So it's taking the molecule, a hydrogen molecule, to be a, a, to have a Gaussian spread of standard deviation lambda. So we did this uh, simulation of hydrogen and deuterium in a zeolite called zeolite rho, which has very narrow pores of molecular si of size, approximately the hydrogen molecule of which is 0.27 nanometers. So in 2005 and six, we published this data, which showed that the transport diffusivity of deuterium at low temperatures is actually higher than that of hydrogen in the zeolite row. At room temperature, uh, the diffusivity is uh, diffusivity ratio is zero uh, is root two in favor of hydrogen. So hydrogen diffuses faster by root two, as you would expect. Uh, Due to Graham's law, uh, as you would expect, uh, at room temperature it diffuses faster. But at low temperature, the hydrogen appears larger to the spore due to the larger quantum uncertainty. And our simulation showed that deuterium diffuses faster below about 94K. Now, uh, unfortunately, we could not experimentally get this material. I contacted uh, somebody, David Corbin, over at DuPont who could send us a zeolite row for experiments, but it had larger pore size. It, that zeolite row had a different silicon to aluminum ratio than the zeolite row that I had used in our simulations. And the structure of the zeolite that we had used in the simulations was di different from the experimental one. Anyhow, we could test by experiments that our quantum simulations were working and they were reproducing the experimental diffusivity in that material, but did not show the that diffusion of deuterium was faster because its pore size was larger, was too large to, uh, for the difference in their size to have any effect. A few years later, I was working with a molecular sieve, three angstrom molecular sieve, Takeda molecular sieve with, uh, for some other purpose. And I saw that its pore size distribution was such that it had a narrow pore neck. It's used for air separation. And it's uh, you, the, in each, the smallest pore size is about 2.7. And it became obvious that it can only be successful for air separation if the pore necks were of this size, which is about 2.8 angstroms or so. So then uh, 
so because you have poor necks of this size, you can separate oxygen and nitrogen. So at this point, it occurred to me that this might be the right material to separate hydrogen and deuterium. So I contacted a friend of mine, a scientist friend at Institute of Law, Langevin in France, and we did experiments using quasi-elastic neutron scattering. Hervé Jovic is a physicist, and uh, which is why I took his help, because as chemical engineers, we are not used to things like neutron scattering, especially quasi-elastic neutron scattering. At that time, I didn't even know what it meant. But uh, I worked with him to measure the diffusivities, and we then estimated, calculated the diffusivities from the quasi-elastic neutron scattering uh, spectrum. And uh, amazingly, we obtained the results here, just as I had wanted, uh, or uh, as I'd hoped. Deuterium below about 100 K was diffusing faster than the hydrogen. So you can see here and here it's about uh, maybe five times uh, faster at about 30 K. So. Lo and behold, we have a process for separating uh, deuterium and hydrogen by uh, using a nanoporous material uh, at very low temperatures. And uh, this is very attractive as compared to fractional distillation, for example, just because uh, it's uh, much cheaper, much less energy consumptive. So this was featured uh, in many, many years. While we published this in Physical Review Letters in 2010, four years after we first predicted it, uh, this was featured in many other scientific journals as a sort of major important result. And since then, a number of groups have started working in the area and have uh, developed uh, various uh, sort of new concepts around the central idea of using nanoporous material for quantum separation of diffusion and hydrogen. And again, this was based on molecular dynamics simulations. Uh, I realize I've been running for a long time. Uh, is there, are there any questions? I'll, there's a few more slides and I will go through them very quickly once we answer any questions. We we'll take questions at the end, uh, so you could continue. Okay, uh, we have time because I know I've uh, run I've run over the initial estimated time, but we have a buffer, right? Yeah, uh, we can extend for another ten minutes. Okay, good, right. So, uh, let me now talk about another application. Uh, I've talked about uh, quantum molecular saving of hydrogen isotopes. Uh, another application that we have recently looked at is uh, mixed matrix membranes. A mixed matrix membrane is uh, basically a membrane in which the active layer, uh, which is the top layer here, uh, comprises of a polymer in which we have an inorganic filler. That inorganic filler is a zeolite or a ZIF or a MOF or a carbon. Uh, it's a nanoporous material that you uh, disperse inside the polymer. And the idea is that uh, the polymer has very narrow pores, but by dispersing a zeolite, which has which gives you higher fluxes, you can improve the flux through the membrane, through the polymer, but yet get the selectivity of the polymer. In other words, <coughs> the ratio of permeabilities of uh, one compound over another, one species over another, will still be dependent on the polymer, but you will get better separation. Uh, better permeability uh, because uh, the flux through a zeolite will be higher through the polymer. So this usually the eff efficiency of a membrane is usually assessed in what is called a Robison plot. Robison plot basically plots the perm selectivity, the ratio of permeability of species A to B versus the permeability of A. So Robison showed that all polymers, he first showed in 1991, that all polymers fall below this line. And if you want to do better than uh, better than a polymer, you have to fall above that line. <clears throat> so that was considered the commercially attractive region. 2008, he improved this. New polymers had been discovered uh, or developed, and the line was improved to this, and that stands to this day. All polymers fall below this line on the Robeson plot. To beat a polymer, to do better than a polymer, uh, you have to be in the region above, which is called the commercially attractive region, and the permeability, selectivity versus permeability must lie in that region. So with this idea, uh, 
to get materials and polymers to fall in this commercially attractive region for long for, for about maybe last uh, decade and a half people have been working on this idea of mixed matrix membranes by adding zeolites to a polymer and and so the membrane layer is really a composite of uh, of this uh, zeolite polymer composite and the idea being you get high sele high selectivity of the polymer yet high flux due to this dispersed phase however there are problems uh, Ideally, if the polymer and the zeolite, for example, which is the blue circle here, they are compatible, there is no defect in the interface, then the molecule that is diffusing through will just go through this as well, and you will see the high flux through the zeolite. However, the zeolite and the polymer are not always compatible, and you can get all kinds of defects at the interface. For example, if you get a void at the defect, if the polymer zeolite interaction is weak, polymer polymer interaction is strong. Uh, then, for example, the van der Waals attraction interaction between the uh, atoms of the polymer uh, and between the polymer chains are strong. They tend to attract each other and then they will go away from the zeolite. You get a void region and the gas molecules as they are diffusing, they will just go through the void and bypass the solid. So you will then, in fact, destroy your selectivity because you have a very high, uh, you can have very high permeability region for both species for all the species and so you will uh, your membrane will just not do it will be even worse than the pure polymer sometimes you can have a rigidified layer that is the polymer is strongly attracted to the zeolite you get a dense layer of polymer around the zeolite then the gas can simply bypass the zeolite and it will go through the polymer and you would not have have you will not get the benefit of the zeolite you'll make it worse again because part of your polymer is no longer permeable Sometimes the polymer can get into the solid and get into the pores of the solid, and then you can block the solid. And once again, you have a problem. So you have all these kinds of defects. Uh, while one cannot get into at the nanoscale, see what is happening, we can use simulations. Experimentally, you cannot see all of this. You can just see that your membrane is not doing its job, but you really do not, you cannot measure the void around this particle that easily or the dense polymer around the particle. There are some there are some experiments that uh, can uh, that are uh, that are being developed to do this, but as yet it doesn't exist uh, effectively. But simulations can tell us what is happening. So we looked at this kind of a membrane. Uh, here's MFI zeolite, which is silica light. And this is a polymer. It's got a long name. Uh, I won't even try to pronounce it. That's here, but most simply, it's called BPDA134 ABP polyimide. These are the polymer chains. So in our simulations, we took a few unit cells of the zeolite right here and put polymer on both sides. And then we uh, studied the gas diffusion through this sandwich. And we could see also the density profiles of the polymer at the interface. And we saw, in fact, that the polymer densifies at the interface. This is the uh, single, uh, this is the monomer of the polymer and each chain of the polymer comprised of 10 such monomers. You see here, this plot shows the density of the polymer divided by the bulk density of the polymer as a function of position in our sandwich. You see, uh, it's pretty the density is pretty close to one, the relative density. That means it's got the bulk density of the polymer. Uh, but as you approach the zeolite, you see uh, a very a strong density peak. So the polymer has densified near the zeolite, which is due to the strong zeolite polymer interactions. So I'm not going to go through the details, the potential energy models, et cetera, uh, but uh, the software, molecular dynamic software has those uh, built in, or we write our own code uh, to, uh, for, the, uh, for the potential energy, interaction potential energies. So you see how the polymer is densifying at the interface. So we then did molecular dynamic simulations First, in the neat polyimide, and this is carbon dioxide and methane in pure polyimide. 
and you can see the values of the diffusion coefficients of CO2 and methane as a function of temperature. I'm plotting it in the Arrhenius plot. The CO2 diffuses faster by maybe factors of three to five. If you look at and you see the values are of the order of 10 of minus 10 to 10 of minus 11 or 12, the diffusivities. In the MFI or the silica light, the diffusivities are of the order of 10 to minus 8. So they are, uh, it is diffusing much faster than the MFI inside the, uh, inside the MFI, it's diffusing much faster than the polyimide polymer. So then we looked at our sandwich and Lo and behold, we find that the diff diffusion coefficient has not increased compared to the polymer. It is in fact decreased significantly. It's decreased by a factor of three to 10 inside the sandwich, even though the MFI has a much higher diffusivity for each of these species than the polymer. So we then, uh, examine the diffusivity just in that really rigidified interface layer. If you look at that interface layer, it's about maybe 10 angstroms thick, about 1.2 nanometers thick. So we isolated that layer and looked at the diffusivity of CO2 and uh, and methane inside that layer in the presence of the zeolite because it is formed only in the presence of the zeolite. So in that simulation, we could look at the trajectories of the molecules through that layer and determine the diffusivities. And we find the diffusivities of CO2 and methane in that rigidified layer alone are pretty close to the diffusivities in the whole sandwich. So you can see it is that diffusivity uh, that the rigidified layer is now controlling the uh, diffusivity. The dense layer is controlling the diffusion through the sandwich. Well, so molecular dynamics allows us to get the, uh, the diffusivities inside uh, our system, but what about the performance of the whole membrane? What we do is we pack particles uh, of whatever size we want. Here, uh, uh, you take the uh, silica part or the silica light -like particles, put them inside a membrane which, uh, or a unit cell, which is 25 microns thick. And this could have, uh, and depending on the loading, say if you want 10% volume by volume of particles or 50% by volume of particles, you put that many particles inside randomize their positions, and then you solve the flux equations for as all the particles inside. So in other words, you put a concentration of, uh, of your species, say CO2 on one side, uh, a certain concentration. On the other side, you have another concentration, and you solve your diffusion equations for all of the 500 or as many particles in the system and the polymers simultaneously. So you've got 500 PDEs, uh, three dimensionals, being solved simultaneously. If you've got 500 particles, you've got 501 PDEs. The, the other PDE is for the polymer. Well, that's for the particles. And then you also solve the, because you know the diffusion coefficient in the interfacial region, you also have to solve uh, a PDE for every interface. <coughs> so you really, if you've got 500 particles, you've got 500 interfaces, you've got 1,000 PDEs, plus one for the polymer that you're solving simultaneously. Uh, we use ComSol software to do it. And you can obtain the flux of each species and the effective permeability of each species inside your membrane that way. Basically, we get our fundamental mo uh, molecular scale properties, which is the diffusivities from molecular dynamics in the polymer, in the part, in the uh, zeolite, silica light and in the interfacial region and we can use them in our finite in a finite element model here and solve all of these pdes three-dimensional together to obtain the permeability of your whole system the permeability is normally uh, defined as the flux divided by the pressure gradient and that turns out to be uh, the, uh, if uh, the diffusivity inside your system multiplied by the solubility which is the density in the system divided by the bulk pressure. So I'm plotting here the permeability of uh, CO2. So if you have CO2 and methane, A is CO2. I'm plotting the permeability of CO2 in our silicalite polyimide uh, 
mixed matrix membrane versus the loading of the part particles at, uh, it could be 10%, 20, 30, 40. So we did these based using the molecular dynamics properties, base properties. We uh, introduced our filler, which is the silicolite in the polymer and did our finite element simulations. What you find is that this is the permeability. The red is the permeability of the CO2 versus the amount of silicolite in the polymer. Now, if that's the non-ideal system with the interface, if you did not consider the interface uh, rigidification, you obtain the blue curve, you obtain slightly higher permeability as you would expect because the interface uh, reduces, uh, is denser and it reduces the diffusivity. Now, if you plot the permeability, the alpha, which is the separate permeability of CO2 to methane, uh, you up versus the permeability of uh, of CO2, you obtain the results that I've shown here. Now, the permeability is always defined in terms of, well, it's defined in terms of barrer. One barrer is uh, given by, uh, in terms of SI units, it's given by this 3.35 10 is from minus 16 moles meter or meter squared second PA. And that comes from this D naught times S. So, you see here that while the ideal system with the ideal with, with no interfacial problem would have given you the blue triangles, the real system gives you this one because of the interfacial rigidification. So actually the interface, while it is reducing the permeability is actually improving the selectivity. This is only a minor improvement in selectivity. So this particular system, which we did first in simulations to sort of develop our techniques, uh, for designing mixed matrix membranes. Uh, this may not be the ideal system to separate these two, but it does show that the interface has a significant role. And maybe in other systems, you can actually see much more, much better improvement due to a, due to the interfacial defect. Now, this was a case in which you had interfacial rigidification. If you take a ZIF, for example, ZIF-8, which has got much more open structure, we actually see voids, micro voids at the interface. And you can see here, that's the density profile of the polymer. You do not see the rigidification. In fact, you see polymer depletion and you see a zone in which the polymer density is lower than the bulk. What we did was we filled up that region. This So this is about a nanometer, if a couple of nanometer region where we uh, 10 angst from or 10, 15 angst from region, I think, where we then we fill it up with an ionic liquid. That ionic liquid is BMIM, BF4. And uh, so that green here is the micro voids or nano voids being filled up with the ionic liquid. Now, uh, when we did our simulations, we found the system really had improved properties. So this is the Robeson plot for that sandwich for this sandwich polymer, uh, and this is the ZIF with the ionic liquid here. If you did the neat polymer, it fell below this Robeson line, the 2008 line. Uh, that's not commercially act attractive. If you just had the polymer and the ZIF-8 without the ionic liquid, you improved the permeability because you had the pol because you had the voids at the interface, but you have reduced the selectivity. That's the selectivity. On the other hand, when you put the ionic liquid, we improved the selectivity and we get this point here. So you can see how simulations help you design our mixed matrix membranes and engineer the interface to get into the commercially viable region. Of course, this is based on the sandwich. This is not the real uh, membrane. In the real membrane, they will not just be going through the, uh, because in the sandwich, it's linear flow through the zeolite and the interface and the polymer. In reality, they will be going through the polymer as well, just by itself, or maybe just through the interface by itself. So it's not just going to the sandwich. So this is a little misleading. We have to do our finite element simulation, just like I showed for the silicolite, uh, in order to get the real situation. But at least based on what we have done, this looks attractive. I think I've I've introduced you to a few applications and what the fundamentals of working at a nanoscale are. So let me end with some conclusions that the nanoscale offers a wide array, a wide array of possible 
possibilities for technological innovation and research for chemical engineers. And the conventional properties used in continuum modeling are inapplicable at the nanoscale where finite size effects become important. Simulation offers a very versatile tool to develop and optimize processes and systems at the nanoscale. And Monte Carlo and molecular dynamic simulations allow us to probe properties of the nanoscale and enable the design of systems and processes where nanoscale effects can be leveraged to improve efficiency. Well, thank you for your attention. And let me end with this picture of uh, the group that invented the Monte Carlo method. Uh, it's known as Metro Metropolis Monte Carlo. That's Metropolis. But the idea was really that of Stanislaw Ulam. And uh, the a famous quotation due to him is the infinite we shall do right away. The finite will take a little longer. And that's because the method originally was developed for periodic systems, which are very large infinite systems, although you're do, you're trying to get properties of the nanoscale. And then uh, the idea that he's saying here is that if you want to really model even nanoscale systems, let's postpone that for some time. But the day has come that we are now dealing with the nanoscale and uh, we are now able to engineer systems at the nanoscale using the techniques developed by these guys. Thank you very much. Take any questions. Yeah. So uh, since we have extended the session a bit, uh, in the interest of time, we'll take only a few questions. Uh, Parimal Parikh is asking any zeolite crystal surface modification to prevent polymer rigidification. Yes, it can be done. Uh, we uh, looked at uh, the void case where you have uh, be introduced ionic liquid. In the dense case, you can disrupt the dense polymer by functionalizing the zeolite. Uh, and we are, in fact, I have a PhD student now looking at that. Experimentally, people introduce uh, different hydrocarbon groups, alkyl groups on the zeolite surface, or even functionalize the polymer uh, to uh, reduce polymer zeolite interactions. So yes, you can functionalize the polymer or the solid to adjust the, to engineer the interface. That is, uh, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Could you please explain the effect of silicon to aluminum uh, aluminum ratio on diffusivity? Uh, okay, let me get to that. Uh, you're talking with respect to uh, uh, this uh, here, right? The zeolite row that I talked about. So, uh, When you, uh, when you have a zeolite, it has got a certain, uh, it's an aluminum silicate. It's got a certain silicon to aluminum ratio in it. And depending on the silicon to aluminum ratio, the pore size will change. For the same structure, for the same zeolite, if you change the adjust the silicon to aluminum ratio, you can change the pore size. Uh, exactly why that happens, I think I'm not the expert at it. Um, uh, those uh, who measure the structure of zeolites and do quantum calculations on the structure, they could answer that question a little better. We do not do that kind of work. But what I can say is that the structure of any material depends on its composition and how the silicon and aluminum atoms arrange themselves, form cages will depend on their ratio. So that affects the pore size. Okay. Is that yeah. So uh, there's another question. Uh, what is right. the impact of uh, new age technologies like artificial intelligence and the like uh, on uh, in this field? Correct. Very good question. Now, one of the most important things in uh, in all these simulations is the uh, potential uh, that you put in, and uh, there is a. So we. Uh, how do we obtain the potential? Partly, uh, they have done quantum calculations uh, for the potential energy uh, and calculated potential energy between atoms, uh, but that's uh, very approximate. In reality, you have to take your, <clears throat> you have to simulate uh, these, uh, your system 
using, for example, uh, e, uh, the Monte Carlo method and obtain, for example, the PVT diagram of a gas. And then you can, you have to fit, fit your Monte Carlo simulation uh, using different potentials to obtain and uh, match the uh, PVT diagram. So here, uh, artificial intelligence is being developed to optimize on the potential. Different potentials are uh, can be uh, chosen. It's it's a very huge field where you can use uh, different potential models, obtain uh, different results, and in, uh, and at any given temperature, you might find one potential works. At another temperature, another potential energy function works. I've explained to you the Van der Waals potential, but there's a lot more detail that goes into it. So, what is the optimal potential energy uh, function for your material? Uh, and uh, I, so, if, it will depend on what is the temperature. A priori, you do not know. So, you can do your calculations for various potentials. We uh, produce results and then uh, you can use AI methods to sift through experimental data, the various results that you have and find out what is the optimal potential for any given condition. That is one. Another, uh, another impact uh, which is now finding increasing interest is in, in choosing which polymer zeolite combination should I use for example, in mixed matrix membranes, which polymers you like combination should I use to affect a given separation? This uh, not, uh, typically is done by trial and error. You will try one zeolite, one polymer, then try another zeolite, another polymer. If instead we can use molecular dynamics and uh, produce transport coefficients for different polymers, different uh, 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 for different zeolites, and uh, also, the diffusivities at the interface, we can use AI techniques to sift through all of this and find out what is the optimal polymer zeolite combination, polymer uh, ZIF combination for a given separation. There's a lot of experiments that would otherwise need to be done and you, sub and you can uh, basically uh, Avoid all of that experimentation if you uh, if you can develop good potentials and do use molecular dynamics in an approximate way to develop a very large amount of data for diffusivities in polymers of different substances. Use uh, uh, and uh, diffusivities in polymers in silica in, zeolite, in uh, zeolites MOFs. Then you can for a given separation you should be able to use AI techniques to be able to sort out and see which is the best material, which is the best uh, pair of uh, polymer zeolite, polymer MOF for a given separation. This uh, is now uh, a hot area. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks Professor Suresh for answering all the questions. Uh, we are done with the questions. Now I'd like to invite Manan, who is the overall coordinator of Azeotropy, to give a quick vote of thanks before we end the session. Thank you, Nilanjan. I hope I'm audible. So, hello, Professor Suryan Rakia. So, on behalf of the whole team Azeotropy, I would like to thank you for taking up time for this event on, on this weekend and providing all of us with this with the wonderful insights about the legal application and concepts of uh, nanoscale engineering. Uh, uh, like I'm glad that last year the event got cancelled, but uh, we are uh, like honored to finally be able to host you this year in the online edition of Asia Trophy. So thanks for that. Uh, I would like to extend my gratitude to all the guests as well uh, for attending the session. I'm sure that your, your curiosity about the nanoscale technology has been big and hope to see you all in other events as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and I'm glad you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Right. So shall we end the session now? Yes, uh, thank uh, you everyone. We'll end the meeting. Thank you. Bye.